Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, <coughs> so the topic is indeed the, the high dimensional expansion. Uh, one should say that the uh, expander graphs have been uh, an extremely useful, a very fertile uh, subject of uh, research for the last uh, 40 odd years uh, with uh, many diverse applications in many areas, uh, including theoretical computer science and uh, uh, statistical physics and uh, even uh, pure mathematics. And in recent years, there is, a, there is an attempt to uh, think about uh, high dimensional versions of uh, graph expansion. And uh, I would like to, uh, to describe some of, uh, some of these attempts uh, and uh, some of the directions taken. Uh, the subject is still uh, in its infancy or at least in early childhood, uh, but still uh, much material has uh, accumulated by now and uh, that's what we'll do. Now, uh, this is the plan. Uh, <coughs> I'll put divide the two talks into, well, naturally divided into two notions of expansion. One is co-boundary expansion and the other spectral expansion. While in the graphical case, these two notions, and I'll explain it in a few minutes, these two notions are essentially the same. In uh, dimensions two and above, they are uh, distinct, they are quite distinct, and uh, deserve a different, uh, different treatment. Um, okay, so in the first talk, I'll talk about co-boundary expansion. This is a high dimensional generalization of what's called the Chigger constant. Uh, which I'll remind you uh, in a minute what it is. Uh, this uh, notion arose in two uh, independent uh, questions, one uh, concerning the homology of uh, random complexes, and the other is uh, Gromov's uh, celebrated work on the topological overlap property. Um, <coughs> after this introduction, I'll uh, describe some attempts to compute the expansion of higher dimensional complex complexes. One is uh, via uh, symmetry and uh, the other is uh, via random uh, constructions. And um, in the second talk we'll talk about spectral expansion. This uh, has to do with topology over the real numbers and uh, we'll define the spectral gap of the Laplacian and uh, see how it uh, reflects uh, various properties of uh, complexes. For example, the existence of colored simplices uh, what's called the Garland method, uh, which is actually predates all this story and is uh, very interesting and a very useful gadget that's uh, useful to know. And uh, some applications of Garland type methods. The first is to homology of uh, random complexes and the second is to uh, some question about uh, hypergraph uh, matching. So uh, let us start uh, with the graphical case. So uh <coughs> Suppose that we have a graph, a one-dimensional complex, and we have a partition of the vertex set, S and S complement, and we look at all the edges between S and N co S complement. Now, the Chigger constant of the graph is the minimum of the size of the, of the partition uh, normalized by the smaller size of the smaller of the two sets. So it's the minimum uh, over S at most V hat of E S S complement over uh, the size of S. Um, the Chigger constant first arose naturally in uh, differential geometry, but it turns out that uh, the differential geometric uh, definition is, uh, is actually pliable, applicable to, to, uh, to graphs and actually one can, one can formulate the uh, uh, differential geometric content of this, uh, of this object, of this notion in graphical uh, theoretical frame. And, um, this, this uh, quantity measures the connectedness of the graph. So we assume that the graph is connected. If the graph is not connected, then there is a partition that uh, disconnects it, and then this would be zero. But once the graph is connected, then this number is big, uh, is bigger than zero. And the bigger it is, the better connected, the more connected the graph is. Um, okay. Um, now, uh, <coughs> this notion, of uh, this combinatorial notion has a, a spectral counterpart, which actu actually captures its, its main uh, spirit. So <coughs> consider the Laplacian of the graph. The Laplacian is just a matrix. It's a V by V matrix. 
it has the degrees on the diagonal and it has minus one in place uv if uv is an edge. Uh, this is a positive semi-definite matrix and uh, it, is, it is positive definite if the graph, if and only if the graph is connected. And <coughs> we look at the, uh, actually there is always the uh, zero eigenvalue which corresponds to the all one, uh, all one vectors. But beside that, uh, the eigenvalues are lambda 2, 2, lambda n. And lambda 2 uh, is called the spectral gap of G. It, um, it somehow measures the again, in a different way, the, connected, uh, the connectedness of the graph. The bigger the lambda 2 is, the more connected the graph is. Okay? Um, now, many properties of the graph, for example, the rate of convergence of random walk on the graph um, and, and other related things can be measured or can be uh, approximated or by spectral gap, gap of the graph. Okay? Now, what is the connection between the Chigger constant and the spectral gap? So I've mentioned that these two notions are essentially uh, the same, at least uh, globally. Uh, there is a famous Alon Milman and Tanner result which says that the size of a cut, ES S complement, is at least S times S complement over N times the spectral gap. And therefore, dividing by the smaller of the S and S complement, it follows that the spectral the figure constant is at least uh, lambda 2 over 2, okay? So if the spectral gap is big, then figure constant is big. And in the other direction, there is a Dudziuk uh, alone result which says that if we assume that the graph is deregular de and D is uh, fixed, then H of G is bounded by this function of lambda 2. Uh, the bottom line or the, the, the moral of these uh, two theorems is that HG and lambda 2 of G are essentially equivalent measures of the graph expansion. Okay. Uh, the degree, the, out the number of uh, edges incident on the, vert on the vertex is D. This is the degree of the vertex. Yeah, please feel free to ask any questions. Okay, and now uh, the question is how to, uh, how to generalize these to high dimensions. So it turns out that both uh, notions, Chigger constant and spectral gap, have analogs in higher dimensions. They are, uh, they are decent an analogs, not just uh, uh, make up analogs, but they are not equivalent. And let me, let me say a few words about uh, each of these, uh, the each of these uh, notions. The first is the notion of uh, co-boundary expansion, and it uh, came up, as I said, in two works. Uh, one uh, concerned the homology of random complexes, and then uh, slightly later uh, in a work, a very famous work on Gromov, of Gromov on the uh, topological overlay property. And then there is a sequence of uh, following work, for example, a work by uh, Anna Gundert and uh, Uli Wagner on the expansion of random complexes and, and so on. Uh, the notion of spectral expansion is, in, f in fact, uh, much older. It dates back to a work of uh, Garland from uh, the early 70s, where he proved the uh, uh, famous conjecture of Serre on the cohomology of discrete groups. I'll say a few words about it on the second lecture. And there are uh, various manifestations of this uh, Garland method. One is uh, work uh, with uh, Aronian Berger on uh, hypergraph matching, so a totally uh, combinatorial uh, application, and there is a more recent uh, one by uh, Kale on the homology of random flag complexes. Okay, uh, so uh, let me now, let us now talk about uh, in this, uh, in this uh, 40 minutes about this uh, co-boundary expansion. And um, co-boundary expansion is uh, defined in terms of simplicial cohomology. Now, uh, most of you, uh, all of you, uh, are uh, familiar with these uh, notions, but let me just, to set uh, the notation, let me just recall the basic, the pertinent fact that we need. So suppose that we have a simplicial complex on V, R will be a fixed abelian group, which usually will be just Z2. An I phase of this simplex is just obtained by deleting D, one of the uh, vertices. CK, the K co chains, are just skew symmetric maps on the set of uh, order simplices. 
Skew symmetric means that if we exchange the V0 and V1, the sign of the phi uh, reverses. Uh, and we have a co-boundary operator, which is a linear operator from CK to CK plus 1. Uh, DK of phi, where phi is a K co-chain, on a K plus 1 simplex is just the alternating sum of phi on the faces of this simplex. Okay? Uh, if we look at the kernel of this map, this is called the K-core cycles. And if we look at the... Uh, <coughs> at the image of uh, dk minus 1, these are the k-core boundaries, and the uh, reduced k-core homology is this uh, quotient. Uh, okay, um, so this was uh, in a way of uh, reminding us what simplicial cohomology is. Now, <laughs> we will be interested in extending the, no the, extending the definition of uh, Hg. So, let me just pause for for one minute. Uh, how do we do it? Okay. H of G was the minimum where a <coughs> of a E S S complement over the minimum of S and S complement uh, over all S's in V. Okay, so this was the definition of the Chigger constant. Now, our job will be to, <coughs> in order to define the higher dimensional Chigger constant, we will have to uh, generalize this notion of cut and this notion of, well, of minimum between these two numbers. And in fact, this notion is much, much easier to, to uh, think of, uh, of, of the right generalization. This is slightly more trickier, but still very simple. So let's start with the cut. So what is a cut? What is a cut in a complex, the cut corresponding to a co-chain? Well, the cut corresponding to a, to a K co-chain is simply the set of the K plus 1 simplices, tau, such that dK phi of tau is non-zero. Okay? Uh, if you think of it, if you... <coughs> want to see the connection here, then this is exactly ESS complement is exactly the support of D0 of the function on the vertices, which is 1S. So we have this vertices S, we have the function which is 1 here, and the function which is 0 on S complement. And the number of edges here is precisely the support of D0 of uh, 1S. Okay, uh, for example, a uh, high dimensional, higher dimensional example, we take these one cochain, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. Now, the, and we take the co-boundary of it, so we see that these two simplices get value 1. I disregard the, uh, the sign at the moment. Just think of it ab above uh, Z2. So D Z D1 of this co-chain on this simplex is just 1 plus 0 plus 0, which is 1. So here the uh, norm of D1 phi is just 1. It's actually what, what's more appropriate would be to call it a Hamming norm of D, uh, DK of phi. Okay, so any questions about this notion? This, this will be the numerator. Okay, now we need the denominator. The denominator is this. Okay, so how do we generalize the denominator? Well, <coughs> we talk about the cosystolic norm of a cochain. So uh, a cosystolic norm of a cochain is defined as follows. We take, the <coughs> we take the size of the support of phi, but we allow to perturb phi by a k by a k co-boundary, so we allow to add to phi d k minus one of psi, where psi is in c k minus one of x, where psi is a k minus one co-chain. Okay, a in in here a zero co a, a zero co-boundary, a zero co-boundary is just one because I mean 
you have to you have to be a non-topologist to to accept this because when you tell this to topologists then they just laugh they say what are you talking about this is this is uh, too simple for us but uh, for combinatorialists it's it's just the right <laughs> about the right level of sophistication so <laughs> we <laughs> so so it turns out that the co-boundary the zero co-boundaries are just the the constant functions which is just one in the case of z2 so you are you take you compare one s the size of the support of one s with that size of the support of one s plus the one vector which is one s complement okay so you compare the size of s with s complement you take the minimum between the two okay so this is the this is the general definition okay so let me give you an example so we start with this we start, start with this co-chain, which is 1, 1, 1. So now, the support of this is 3, but I claim that I can perturb it to decrease its support to just 1. How do I perturb it? I add to it d0, d0 of, of the function which is 1 on AB and 0 on CD. So this function is exactly the cut between AB and its complement. And, and if I take, <coughs> if I take the D0 of 1 AB, what I get is this co-chain. And when I add phi with this perturbation, what I get is just one here. So the one, this one, this one, and this one cancel with these three ones. And what we get here is one. And this is the right, uh, so to speak, the right notion of co-systolic norms. So we don't look at phi, but we look at the, uh, at the, at the uh, all phi, all perturbations of phi by k, k co-boundaries. Okay. And now that we have the numerator, we have the denominator, we just have to take, we divide them, this we know. Okay. Yeah, it's. Y yeah, you. This, this is uh, this is a, a key point actually, and and actually the the key is that we actually take this this uh, naive norm. Uh, taking a non a, a non naive norm like L two norm, something like that, is actually get us back to harmonic measures and get us back to things like the continuous Hodge theorem and so on. It turns out that, and, and I think this is the this this is the the, the high point, say in the Gromov theorem, that actually, just just uh, looking at the at the uh, Hamming norm, and its uh, and its close uh, relatives, gives you the, the right notion for for his for his application also for other applications. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, definitely one can take other norms and. Uh, Say the one norm is very interesting, but uh, almost non-manageable as usual. Okay, so now suppose that we have phi, and we can define the expansion of phi as dk phi over the uh, over the cosystolic norm of phi, and the k expansion constant is just the minimum of these uh, ratios, where phi belongs to c k minus b k. Well, we have to be careful. Because if we take something in BK, then the cosystolic norm would be zero because it's already in BK. Then we can add to it itself, and then we get zero. And and DK will also phi will also be zero because it's a, a DK of a of a co-boundary. Uh, therefore, we restrict ourselves to these phi's. And this is this is the Chigger constant, K K expansion constant. Now, if G is a graph, then we are we are back to uh, to the usual Chigger constant, provided that we take f2 coefficients. Uh, now, a, a very simple but critical observation is that if hk is the k cohomology is zero, if and only if hk is positive, because if hk is zero, then what does it mean? It means that <coughs> it means that there is no there is no co-cycle except co-boundaries, right? So, all 
the numerator will always be non-zero. Yeah? Now, being uh, the numerator is zero if and only if phi is a cosi is a k cosicle. So hk is zero if and only if we don't get zeros, we never get zeros here. Okay. So the namely the trigger constant is positive. Now, we can think of the k-expansion constant, just as in the uh, graphical case, we can think of it as a measure of the connectedness, k-connectedness of the graph of the complex. So once we have that hk is zero, we want to say how zero is this zero. So, uh, so the bigger it is, the more zero it is. Um, okay. Uh, now, uh, the first computer, now one can ask, can you compute this quantity uh, before even starting to look for application? So it turns out that in uh, both uh, the work on the uh, random complexes in, uh, and in Gromov's work, uh, the, first, the first thing to do was to, compu to compute the expansion of a simplex. Well, the simplex is the realization of the complete graph. It is uh, uh, perhaps uh, undeniably the, the simplest uh, simplicial complex there is. So it's just a yeah, simplex on n vertices. And the result is that hk minus 1 of delta n minus 1 is at least n over k plus 1. And uh, let me, so it's very big. The, the, this, this complex has very large uh, expansion. And it stands to reason because uh, this complex, you see that it's, it's really, it's of course contractible but it's contractible in the most uh, contractible sense. You can just, it's, yeah, every, it's, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a star on every vertex. Um, so indeed the number here is big. Uh, this is, this is sharp if k plus one divides n. Uh, for example, let k be two. So, and divide partition our uh, ground set into three parts, each of equal size n over three. Now, look at this code chain. It's a one code chain, which con consists of all edges between one part and the other part. Now, the size of this one code chain is n over 3 squared. This is, a, this is phi. Actually, this is an upper bound, but one can, one can see that actually you cannot do better even by perturbing. On the other hand, d1 of phi norm is, well, these are just all the colorful triangles because namely uh, triangles which have one vertex in each part. Because look at this triangle, then it, if you take the co-boundary of this co-chain, then it gets value one on this such simplex very simple and when you divide the two you get equality one should say that uh, one can wonder is there equality here uh, in other cases well amazingly uh, Dimitri Kozlov proved that h1 of delta n minus 1 is exactly n over 3 uh, n over 3 uh, as long as n is not a power of 2 this is a very surprising result Okay, uh, now, now I'd like to describe the two, uh, if, um, the two first applications of this uh, notion of expansion. Uh, okay, so the first is to a model of random complexes. So <coughs> uh, this, ran this uh, model is YK and P. So what is YK and P? You take the complete k minus one skeleton of the n minus one simplex, all the all the simplices up to dimension k minus one, and then you throw in each k simplex with probability p independently. Okay. This is just a straightforward generalization of the Erdős-Rényi uh, uh, model of random graphs. Okay, and now you can ask in. In Anders Randy model, you can ask what is the threshold for connectivity? So we start with p equals to zero, then the graph is completely disconnected. We increase p, we increase p. At some point, the graph will become connected. 
certainly when P is 1, the graph is completely connected. So, and that's asking for H0 of the graph. Now, what if we ask for HK minus 1 of Y? When does HK minus 1 of Y disappear? Uh, okay. So the answer, at least the partial answer, is this. Suppose that we have a finite abelian group R, then the threshold for the disappearance of the K minus 1 cohomology. So at the beginning, you have many, many spheres, many K minus 1 spheres inside your complex. At some point, they disappear. This is the point, when P is K log N over N, exactly at this point. Uh, in the elder Schreni case, it's log n over n. Yeah. Um, now, uh, I should say that there is some uh, recent work uh, concerning, uh, uh, concerning the coefficient z, but I won't get into, into that. This is the result. And why is, this, why is expansion relevant to this? The reason is very simple. Because let's... <coughs> uh, let, let, us, let us try to do the most naive thing, namely to do the uh, union-bound argument. So we'll, uh, look, we will look at a k minus 1 uh, co-chain and ask, what is the probability that this co-chain becomes, a, 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 this co-chain is a, a k, k minus 1 co-cycle? So the probability that it's a co-cycle can be computed precisely. What does it <coughs> when is it a co-cycle? Suppose that we have this guy, this one, one co-chain. What is the probability that it is a co-cycle? It's <coughs> the probability, it's exactly the probability that, that d1 of phi, d1 of phi, of tau will be zero for any tau in in our y. But <coughs> but this means that all this all the all the support this means that the support of D1 of phi this means this is equivalent to the support of d1 of phi intersection with y is equal to the empty set. This is the empty set, not the right? And the, this probability is precisely a dk, min, dk phi norm, 1 minus p, which is the probability that one simplex will not appear, to the power of dk phi norm. So we have to miss all these simplices. Now, uh, by, the, by the expansion constant of the simplex, this is at most 1 minus p uh, to the n uh, times the cosystolic norm of phi divided by k plus 1. So uh, uh, surprisingly, this, uh, this naive computation, if you apply the uh, union bound, uh, is sufficient to prove that uh, homology disappears at uh, about k squared log n over n. If you want the precise k log n over n, you have to do something else. But, uh, but, uh, but certainly this is, this is the connection. It has been used in other, uh, uh, occur other uh, situations in uh, random complexes. Okay, so this is one application. Uh, the other application, for the other application, I have... Uh, uh, yeah, there, there, is, uh, there is a sequence of work uh, culminating in work uh, recently by uh, uh, Nati Lilial and Yuval Perez, uh, you <laughs> sorry, not Yuval, <laughs> Yuval Pellet, Yuval Pellet, his student, that uh, give a notion of a uh, largest component in the real case. And uh, yeah, so, so this is, in that case, No, no, the transition is, uh, is at some number, C. Actually, that's, that was the holy grail, the, and still the holy grail of, uh, 
telling what is C exactly, it's C over N, has to be C over N, but C is a uh, is solution of some complicated equation. It's uh, I the natural thing would be to to assume that it would be K over N, but it turns out that, yeah, that's not. Um, Okay, so so for for, um, uh, for Gromov's application, we need a slightly different notion, a weighted notion of uh, uh, of expansion, and and this is what's called the Garland weights. Uh, so, in in the pre in our previous definition of expansion, we talked just about the Hamming weight. Now we assign to each uh, to each uh, simplex we assign a weight. And the weight is proportional to the number of top simplices that uh, contain it. So we will be talking about uh, pure simplicial complexes, namely complexes that any simplex is contained in an n-dimensional phase. Okay, so this is a different system of uh, weights, which is more uh, natural to use. And the definitions here are precisely the same, but using this, sis this system of weights. And you have the weighted k expansion defined by uh, the ratio between dk phi norm uh, with the weights divided by uh, the cosystolic norm with the weights. Okay. Uh, the details here are, are slightly uh, well are not very important. Now let me tell you about uh, the Gromov's application, and its starting point is in the following question. Suppose that you have many points in the plane. Now, uh, and you look at the triangles generated by these points. So there are n choose three triangles. Now I want to pierce as many triangles as possible with a single, uh, how do you call it, a screw or something like that. Yeah, you, with a single needle. How many, how many, ne how many triangles can I, can I pierce with a single needle? Okay, and in general, you have a point in RK, and you look at all K plus one tuples, and you look at the convex hull, and you want to ask <coughs> how many D, how many K simplices can I pierce with single point, with single needle. Here is a theorem, beautiful theorem of uh, Imre Barney from the 80s. What, uh, what Barney's theorem says, that you can actually pierce a percentage of the points. That's a very strong uh, claim, that the percentage is not big, it's 1 over k plus 1 to the k, but you can pierce as many as a percentage of the points. You can see this is the, this is the picture. So we have the green triangle, the uh, something, I don't know, red triangle, blue triangle, and they all are pierced by this point. Okay, so this is Barney theorem. Uh, now, uh, the question is, there is a, a, a natural, so to speak, a extension of this to continuous map. So you can think of a sequence of endpoints in RK as a affine functions from the n minus one simplex to RK. Just look at the images of the vertices of delta n minus one. Now, what if I just take a continuous map from delta n minus 1 to RK? Again, I will get wiggly, uh, wiggly triangles. And the question is, how many wiggly triangles can I, uh, can I pierce with one point? And uh, Gromov's result says that, again, you can pierce as many as a percentage of all, uh, all wiggly simplices by a single point. And actually, uh, if, if, you, if, you've if you've looked uh, seriously at the last uh, slide, uh, then this number is actually smaller than, uh, than uh, Barney's uh, number. So it's a generalization, both an improvement of the constant and a vast generalization to continuous map. So, so this is... Um, this is, well, I think it's fair to say that it's a sensational uh, work. It appeared about 10 years ago, something like that, or maybe eight years ago. Th this constant is bigger. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's both. Uh, it's, it's bigger. Uh, it's, it's about e to the k times the former constant. But uh, this, 
both constants are still far away from a best possible. It's not known, except for dimension two and then maybe three. No, dimension two, it's not known what's the best constant. Uh, in any case, uh, uh, but this, this is only half of the story, because what Gromov proved is even a stronger result, which really depends on the notion of, uh, of expansion. And his result is as follows. Now you have a continuous map, not from the simplex, but for any just any old complex to RK. And uh, suppose that the complex is uh, k-dimensional, that doesn't, doesn't matter. And you would like to know how many images of k simplices in X can we pierce by one point? Okay, and it turns out that the crucial condition which will guarantee it is that the uh, expansion, uh, Alagromov, uh, namely weighted expansion, will be a, a, a bounded away from zero for all i between zero and k minus one. Okay, once this is holds, then there exists a delta which depends only on k and epsilon such that for any continuous map from X to RK, there is a point that uh, pierces at least a fraction of all the K uh, images of the K simplices. Okay. Hmm? A general complex, completely general complex, except that it has to be an expander. This is, this is a non-trivial requirement since we know that it's very hard to construct ex expander graphs No, a simplicial complex. Simplicial complex, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how much time do I have ti till the break? Uh, you're done. You're done. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, okay. Very good. Okay, so uh, yeah. le let me skip uh, the part on uh, computing expansion through symmetry and uh, move to uh, the, the, the question of expander complexes. So. <coughs> As I've mentioned, uh, as, as we, we already saw, uh, in of course, a generalized uh, way, uh, the complete graph is an excellent expander, but we pay for it. We pay for it by having a lot of edges, well, the maximum number of edges. So, uh, the tr <coughs> so it's no big deal finding very, very dense graphs with excellent expansion. Uh, the, the challenge is even in the case of graphs, is to find a family of graphs which have, which has these two seemingly contradictory properties. So on one hand, the expansion, the trigger constant is at least epsilon. On the other hand, the graph is sparse. Namely, it has linear number of edges, and uh, furthermore, more than that, the maximum degree, each, each vertex has degree at most d. Now, so, so you see, on one hand, it looks it's very sparse. On the high other end, it's very connected, uh, as, uh, as uh, reflected by the positive bounded away from zero trigger constant. Now, uh, the question whether such two things can uh, live in peace uh, together was uh, resolved by uh, Pinsky, who uh, in the 60s, who show that if you take a random uh, d-regular uh, graph, as long as d is at least three, then there is some epsilon, say uh, one over a million, such that, uh, d, such that this uh, random graph is a d epsilon expander. So it has trigger constant at least epsilon and degree at most uh, d. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, Margulis was the first, uh, again in the early 70s, to give an explicit construction of expanders. No, th thi this is, uh, if it's by now, uh, but nowadays uh, uh, standard, this is a very easy result. On the other hand, this is by nowadays standard is, uh, is hard as it was uh, in uh, the early 70s. And actually, Lobotsky, Phillips, and Sarnak, and Margulis uh, gave later the uh, constructions for Ramanujan graph, which is uh, in a sort of way uh, optimal family of expanders, and there are many more works on expanders, uh, dozens of uh, constructions, and expanders play a really important role, say, in, uh, in uh, 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 
a randomness reduction in algorithms in uh, other re related uh, applications. Uh, now, the question is how to, uh, what are expander complexes? So for this, we had to define the degree of a simplex. The degree of a simplex is simply the number of uh, uh, number of simplices of dimension one above that contain it. So if we're talking about a two-dimensional complex, the degree of uh, an edge is the number of triangles that contain it. And uh, KD epsilon expanders are just family of, of complexes with number of vertices going to infinity. And the degree of each k minus one simplex is at most b, while uh, the k minus one Fidel constant is at least epsilon. Okay. And uh, the question is, does this ex does such thi do such things exist for k at least k? So uh, one can ask for a two for two constructions. One is just a construction for k d epsilon expanders. And um, and another, uh, somewhat more uh, uh, more ambitious uh, uh, wish could be to construct complexes that are J D exp epsilon expanders for all J at most k. It turns out that uh, that both these questions are hard, and uh, hardly anything is known. But I'll tell you something that is known. Um, so far, there are no explicit construction for any of these things. Uh, there are uh, candidates actually for the stronger uh, for the stronger uh, family, but they are it has not been proved. These are uh, called these are some some objects that I'll, I may have uh, some time to say something about them. Uh, but there are a probabilistic construction of K D epsilon expanders, and let me uh, let me discuss one of such constructions. And that construction uh, depends on the notion of a random Latin square. Okay, so what is a lat Latin square? Uh, just uh, ignore this uh, uh, this uh, verbal uh, uh, part. This is a Latin square. So it's an n by n array with numbers one to n in each of the n squared places, and in each row or column you have uh, one. You have the complete and uh, the complete set of n numbers, so one, two, three, four. Okay, so this is a Latin square, and um, and our s our complexes, our random complexes, will live in this d complex. There will be subcomplexes of this complex, which I'll describe now. This complex has a uh, three colors, three colored uh, families of uh, vertices. A's, B's, and C's, and we take for the complex all, all the simplices which are three colored. So have the vertex in blue, red, and uh, green. Okay. It turns out that topologically this is a bunch of uh, spheres. This is not very important to our uh, to our uh, uh, mission because our complexes will be a uh, uh, subcomplexes of this, which will be very, very small, which will have only a linear number. Here you have, uh, sorry, here you have n cubed uh, simplices. Our complexes will only have n squared simplices okay. around the n squared. Okay, uh, now we can associate a subcomplex of the previous d complex with a Latin square. How do we do it? It's very simple. Look at this uh, Latin square, this two by two Latin square. Now we construct uh, this. Uh, the the two here is the size of the color set a one a two b one b two and c one c two. Now uh, this Latin square tells us how to add the two simplices. So in we connect a one uh, b one to d we form a triangle of A1, B1, and C1 because in place 1, 1, we have 1. Now, we let's look at place 2, 1. So uh, we connect uh, A2, B1 with C2. So A2, B1 with C2. Okay, this is the construction. 
Now, uh, this construction has uh, exactly uh, n squared, uh, n squared uh, faces, because for each i and j, we connect it to a single, single triangle. Okay. Now, this topologically is very boring because it's actually, it's a one that it's two dimensional only, but it's fake two dimensional because we can push the free edges, each edge here is free, we can push it inside and it would become a one dimensional complex. So no two homology. But if we, if we, uh, and a lot of one homology, it has a lot of lots of one homology, but we can take two Latin squares and take the, <coughs> complexes that they generate, take the union, and then, in this case, we'll get the full uh, octahedral sphere. You can check that it's the full octahedral sphere, and that already has interesting two homology, but uh, boring uh, one homology, which is exactly what we want, because we want to construct things which that will have a H1 positive. But for H1 positive, we need that the first homology is zero. So we have, we need to co close all one-dimensional uh, holes. Okay. Now, uh, okay, so what is our model? Our model is uh, extremely simple. We take D fixed. D will be fixed, fixed number. And we take a random D uh, Latin squares. You have the universe of Latin squares, and you pick randomly a Latin square, D Latin squares, from this universe. And we construct the union of the YLD, the, y, uh, the y, YL1, union YL2, union YLD. What we get is out of this boring uh, YLI, we get a space which, which, is, uh, which is hopefully not boring. In particular, it has to have a trivial uh, one homology in order that H1 will be positive. Uh, and our result, it's a joint result with Alex Robotsky, is the following. That such things with probability uh, going to one are uh, expanders. So uh, <coughs> this space will be called Y and D. And with probability going to one, H1 is uh, positive. Positive uh, for some epsilon bounded away from zero where it's bounded away by this uh, embarrassingly simple uh, small numbers, but still, it is still positive. And the number of simplices that we have to take, the number of Latin squares that we have to take is again embarrassing. So I have two embarrassing numbers here, but uh, okay. Uh, but still they are finite. Uh, the correct number should be four actually, but uh, that's life. Um, and uh, okay, so this is this is the result. Note that. Uh, okay, so so what is d? D is the number of Latin squares that we choose. But you see, each edge, each each just any edge, in one Latin square gets one sim one triangle. So if we take d Latin square, we get d triangle. Yeah. So it's the degree. Exactly. Okay, uh, recently there has been extension of this uh, by uh, uh, Lobotsky, Tsur Luria, and uh, Ron Rosenthal to higher dimension with uh, some, some uh, related uh, models that use uh, Kibosh, Kibosh's uh, uh, work on the, on, the, uh, on the Steinert triple system. Anyway, this is the result, and uh, let, me, let me skip the uh, let me s let me just say one word concerning the proof. The proof uh, has uh, several uh, several ingredients. One of them is a probabilistic ingredient, and the thing is that you have to work on this space, the space of Latin square. Uh, the problem with this space is that we we don't really know how to work with this because we don't even know how to count Latin squares, let alone to compute exact probabilities. But it turns out that. You can, one can actually prove something, uh, uh, some large deviation inequality using various uh, techniques. And uh, it turns out that this large deviation inequality is uh, crucial to the, to the argument. Um, okay, but let me, let me move to the yeah, second part of the talk. Uh, this is about spectral expansion. 
Okay, so what is spectral expansion? We have seen the Laplacian of Lorac, and uh, we looked at the spectral gap of the Laplacian, and we want to extend to uh, generalize this spectral gap to higher dimensional complexes. And for this, we need the notion of higher dimensional uh, uh, Laplacians. Okay, uh, now we will work with uh, real coefficients. Um, this is essential here. And we look at the K co-change with real coefficients, and uh, we, we have some weights, positive weights, on, the, on these simplices, and we define an inner product, just by uh, the standard inner product times uh, C sigma. And uh, with this inner product in hand, we have uh, the adjoint DK star of the uh, K differential, and we can form a this uh, this operator, which is obtained by taking going taking the differential from C K to D C K plus one and back using D K star. This is one. This is called the upper Laplacian, and this is a se positive semi-definite operator. And similarly, we can define the lower Laplacian taking first dk minus 1 star and then moving up by dk minus 1. And the sum of these is the just the usual uh, k Laplacian uh, of x. Now, uh, this Laplacian uh, usually encountered uh, in the uh, realm of uh, uh, continuous or, differen or differentiable uh, manifold uh, is, is uh, well, it's just in this case, it's just an operator between two, lin uh, two uh, linear spaces of uh, bounded uh, of uh, finite dimension. You can write the uh, you can write the uh, matrix uh, that defines this uh, operator. This is not important for us at the moment. And uh, in the case of a of, of a graph, then what we get is almost the Lapla the original Laplacian. Uh, so it's actually exactly the original Laplacian that we talked about, plus the all one matrix. This is uh, just uh, a technical uh, point uh, that has to do with uh, reduced uh, homology. Okay. Now, uh, just as in the uh, differentiable case, we can talk about the harmonic co-change. These are, these are the, the kernel of uh, the case Laplacian. These are all phi's, such as dk phi is zero and dk star phi is zero both of them, and we know that their harmonic forms are exactly, or uh, yeah, they are isomorphic, or exactly the, uh, the K homology of, K cohomology of X, right? And we can, we let mu K of X be the minimal eigenvalue of delta K, then uh, by definition we have this vanishing criterion if this operator does not have the zero uh, eigenvalue, then it means that the kernel is zero, and therefore the homology is zero. So mu k is positive if and only if hk with real coefficients is zero. Okay, so we can see that, uh, that we, or we can hope at least that uh, mu k will somehow uh, tells us something about how strong is this statement, how rigid is this statement. So how zero is this zero? So this is another option of defining a, a expansion of a complex, K expansion. Okay, so this is what's called, simply this is the spectral expansion of the complex, mu K. Now, um, of course, the, the interesting thing is how does this number reflect the uh, topology or the combinatorics of X? And uh, so let me give a, a one one simple example, uh, let X be a, a simplicial complex that contains the full K minus one skeleton and is contained and is K dimensional. And uh, suppose that we have a, a coloring of the vertices. We, we, divide, we uh, partition the vertex set into K plus one parts. And we want to count the number of colorful simplices, simplices that have one vertex in each set. Then it turns out that if that this number can be lower bounded in terms of the uh, of the spectral gap, the K minus one spectral gap. 
this is essentially a, a precise extension of, of the uh, Alon Milman Tanner result. And actually, the proof is the same. So uh, it tells us that the number of colorful uh, K plus one colorful simplices is at least the product of the sizes of the VIs divided by normalizing by n times the spectral gap. Uh, okay, this is the proof. Okay. Now, uh, I would like to go back a little bit in time and tell you why, why is this, I mean, how indeed a new K, why is new K important? So for this, we need uh, the quantity that we already defined, that C uh, sigma, which we called previously the, uh, the garland weight of the, of the complex. So we, we give more weight to a simplex that is contained in many uh, top dimensional spaces. So I mean we have to we have to give give, give honor where wherever honor is due, but that's that's what we do. Uh, now the uh, Garland theorem is a is a very a very a nice uh, nice result, which is of the local to global uh, uh, type. So it tells us the following. Let, let's look at this, at this uh, statement, to the spectral case. Suppose the, the complex, we are interested in HD minus one, okay, of the complex, the three cortices. Now, take the D minus two synthesis, and each D minus two simplex, look at the, its link. Its link are all the edges that together with this simplex form a simplex in X. So this, this x tau, which is the link of, x, of tau in x, is just a graph. This is just a graph. Now, Garland theorem says that if you look at all such, all such obtained graphs, and if all of them are superb expanders, so this, this, is, this is a big spectral gap. It's not something that you will find uh, just on the street. You have to work for it. Okay, and but if this happens, then the D minus one homology is good. So having links, uh, very good expanders, uh, implies that the D minus one homology is zero. And uh, and actually, it's uh, it's it's more general than this. And um, and okay, and this method has uh, many applications and uh, and can be considered actually Garland proved it for used it for um, uh, for for the following results uh, uh, let me let me tell you quickly what it is suppose that we have a d-dimensional complex such that the links of every vertex is gq what is gq gq is the graph of the projective plane so the points here are the the points here are just the points of the uh, and the lines of the projective plane and you connect a point to a line if they if the point is on the line so altogether uh, this is uh, these are the parameters of this graph it's a graph with uh, a, a average degree which is about square root with degree which is about square root of the size of the graph so it's not constant but it's uh, it's fairly good and uh, an old computation of uh, uh, Robert Steinberg I think says that these are excellent expanders in fact they are in some sense they are optimal expanders and uh, Garland using his theorem just uh, concludes that if the links are such a uh, projective plane graph, then hd minus 1x uh, over r is zero. And this essentially uh, proves an, an old conjecture of, uh, this is a work from the 70s, it proves an old, con old conjecture of, uh, of Sayer on the cohomology of uh, discrete groups. The, the translation is, uh, is, is not very difficult, but uh, this is actually the heart of the proof. Um, this, this is, uh, um, but uh, let me let me s uh, let me describe another application of the Garland method uh, of and of spectral gap. 
Uh, and this is to flake complexes. So uh, what is a flake complex? Suppose that we have a graph. So yeah. the basic, uh, the basic uh, object here is a graph. Okay? And uh, we look at the clicks of this graph and construct a complex. So if this, the graph is this house, then uh, the, only the only triangle here is this triangle. So we fill it, and this is the complex. And this, is, this looks as like a very special type of complexes, but they are not really very special because if you take a first subdivision of the complex, then you'll get a, a flag complex. Okay? And they have uh, various uh, properties. So, for example, what is the smallest, the smallest sphere that we can put inside a, a flag complex? Well, uh, it turns out to be the, uh, the octahedral sphere, and the same in high dimensions. Um, and there is some kind of uh, what's called the uh, uh, LD, uh, LDT, lower bound theorem, for the number of the faces of the flag complexes. And uh, let me skip this. Sorry. Okay. Okay. And now, okay, now there is a question of if you take the graph, then the complex is determined. Now, this means that we should we should, by, by justice, be able to say something about its higher spectral gaps in terms of the graphical spectral gaps. I mean, th this is not necessarily uh, and, and not obvious, but it stands to reason. Because this is a, everything is determined by the graph, so there is a hope that we can, we can say something about mu k in terms of mu zero or lambda, lambda two. And uh, and this is indeed the, the case, and uh, and the result is that if lambda two, if the spectral uh, gap of the graph is at least this, this is a big number, but but it can happen, then uh, the k's homology of X v is uh, zero. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I won't say uh, much about the proof, except that it's a, it's a kind of a global version of, a, of, a, um, of the result of Garland. And um, it uses a similar idea. Um, okay. And it's actually sharp. It's sharp uh, when you take the complete uh, k type graph on v1 to vk then you can check that it's lambda 2 is k minus 1 times n over k, and, um, and actually x of t k n, if you look at the clique complex here, then it has k minus 1 homology. So we are <coughs> when we have equality here, we cannot guarantee that the homology here will be 0. OK, why, why is this good? For, for what is it good? Uh, it's good for uh, for the following thing. Uh, look at the independence complex of the graph. So again, the vertex set is V, and the simplices are all independences. Namely, the, the vertices that have no edge between them. And we look at the homological connectivity of uh, Y, and the homological connectivity we it's it's uh, it's one plus this number. Uh, it's about it's two more than the what we call connectivity of the complex, but it doesn't matter. It's just a translate which makes uh, the result sound better. And it turns out that uh, using the previous theorem, it turns out that the connectivity of I V is at least n over lambda n of t, the last, the highest eigenvalue of V. Okay. Uh, and now one can ask, uh, uh, who cares? And uh, Yes. Random walk. That's that's correct, but uh, but in terms of the uh, co connectivity of 
there is kind of duality here between uh, uh, so I of B is sort of yeah it, it measures independence and actually here here it's this is actually lambda two of something else so uh, okay so it's not fair. We are working over R, so it's, uh, yeah, as long as vanishing is concerned. Yeah, so. So this is independent concept. In fact, there is something that for which there is more than one measure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, so something else. There is, there is some, uh, okay. So actually, it's, uh, okay, there is, there is a graph that lies, lurks in the back. Now we have to do some operation of, of, of this graph in order to get this result and this operation consists of blowing up the graph. So replacing each vertex by a bunch of vertices in a correct way. And then we take this, its minimal eigenvalue, and then that minimal eigen, that uh, spectral gap translates into lambda n of t. And this is, okay, yeah. So, um, yes, okay. So, um, yeah, uh, and now to the applications. So I think that uh, all of us have seen this, uh, what's called the whole theorem. Whole theorem tells us that uh, if we have a bunch of uh, girls and uh, each of them knows uh, some set of boys and we want to marry uh, the girls to the boys, then we can do it as long as each subset of girls know at least its size the number of boys. Okay, so it's it's of course a, a necessary condition, but it's also sufficient. And this is an old result by by Hall uh, and uh, and maybe others. So this is Hall's theorem. This is Hall's theorem. So if the union of a i is each i, then for all i, then a one to a n has an SDR system of distinct uh, dis distinct representatives. So a x1 and a1, xn and a, and that they are all uh, distinct. Now, what happens if rather than a graph, we have a hypergraph? So we have, and not not just one, and but many, just f1 to fn. Each one of these consists of many sets. And now we want to marry one to a subset here, and two to a subset here, and two to a subset here, in such way that the subset will no o not only be distinct, but they will be disjoint. So rather than, than we think of this bunch of sets, and this bunch of sets, and this bunch of sets, and I want to choose one from here, one from here, and one from here, such that they all will be a, a pairwise disjoint. Now, this is a problem which is a namely when do we get an SDR, this is an empty complete problem even if all the Fs are consists of two element sets. So we cannot expect uh, something like whole theorem, something like that. This, is, uh, this would not be uh, realistic, but still there are some sufficient conditions. So for example, here, here there is no SDR because uh, if we take one one blue set, then already, so we take the blue set from here, then already we cannot take, uh, we can take neither of these black sets. So we are done. And here there is an SDR, we can check. Okay? Now, there is a notion of matching. A matching is, a matching is the maximal number of disjoint sets that you can choose in a family of sets. So for example, here the maximum matching is of size p. Choose this and this and this, or this and this and this, but not more. And here, this is the funnel plane, you can choose just one. The, the, the sets are the lines, these seven lines, including the circular line, circular line. A any two of them intersect. Now the Aroni Axel theorem, very nice theorem, tells us that gives us a sufficient condition for the existence of SDR, which generalizes all conditions. It says that if we take these, say, three 
the three families. And if the matching number of these three families is uh, at least r times uh, 3 minus 2, which is 2, or 3 minus 1, which is 2, so 2r, two then f1 to fn has an fdr. So when you take uh, r to be 1, then you get exactly a whole theorem, right? Because you get the mi, mi would be just these these things, and you get the number of number of uh, void uh, i girls no uh, is bigger than i minus one, namely at least i. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah, we are the yeah the the, the, the families consist of r elements of. Okay, so this is our only actual theorem. And now, uh, let me tell you, this is the final, final slide, I think. Let me tell, tell you about the following uh, extension. Now, a matching was just a collection of these two sets. Now, there is a notion of fractional matching. Fractional matching is, well, what we do is we assign, okay, so, so what is a matching in another word? If we take a, a point, we take a vertex, then it belongs only to one set, at most, one of these sets. A fractional matching is an assignment of weights to the sets, assignment of weights here, such that if you take a point and you look at all the sets that contain it, the sum of the weights that we assign is at most one. So this is a... This is a reasonable fractional uh, fractional visualization of, uh, of of matching numbers. Now, uh, I just I just drew to you this final plane, which has mi equals to uh, one. You have just you can choose just one uh, set in a matching, but you can choose you can have a much bigger a mi star, much bigger fractional matching. Namely, put a weight of third on each of these seven sets, and since each point belongs to three sets, the total point weight of a point will be one. And now, rather than weight one of a single set, here we get seven over three. Seven over three is, well, it's much bigger than one by some measure. Yeah, okay, and this generalizes, and uh, mu of uh, the finite projective plane of order n, these are just the lines of the projective plane of order n, they are n squared plus n plus one of them. You can choose just one line, because as we know in projective uh, geometry, any two lines intersect. On the other hand, if you put weight of one over n plus one over each of these, on each of these sets, then this turns out to be a fractional matching, and its total weight is much bigger. Okay? And now the theorem using that uh, garland-type theorem is as follows. It replaces in the aroni axel theorem, it replaces me by an a potentially much bigger number, which is me star. So if f1 to fn are uh, families of R sets, and for all i, mi star of the union of any i of them is at least is bigger than r times i minus one. Then you can choose f one from f one and f n from f n, such that they will be uh, disjoint. Um, so this maybe uh, it maybe look a bit far from a spectral uh, from a spectral gaps of higher Laplacian, but it's actually from yeah we, we use uh, we use that uh, eta which is this is the connectivity of the independence complex in terms of the spectral uh, well in terms of the highest eigenvalue of the G which is yeah okay thank you